Our special guest today is a master and teacher in meditation, in well-being, in health, and expanding consciousness. He has written 92, 92 books, and his latest bestseller is called Abundance, The Inner Path to Wealth. And I had the privilege to write the foreword for the new book of Deepak Chopra. Dr. Chopra, welcome. Thank you for being our guest today. Thank you for having me and thank you for doing the forward. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really have great respect for you. Um, you're a wise man, 75 years old, healthy and vital. But please tell me one thing. How can a human being write 92 books in one lifetime? It's an attitude, you know, I have the attitude that... Uh, um, the divine writes the books and I collect the royalties. So <laughs> I, every night before I sleep, I ask myself questions. And also before meditation, I ask myself questions. Then I get some insights. And then I start writing. And I don't have a book in mind. I have notes. And I, I write many notes on many subjects and then two or three somehow evolve into the books and then I submit them to my publishers, to my editors and sometimes they say this is too abstract, do this, do that and you know I regard my editors as very knowledgeable and wise as to what will what will resonate with a reading audience because a lot of what I write actually I think maybe not doesn't even resonate. It's just my own uh, reflections to myself. So that's the process. And is it true that the first time you wrote a book way back, uh, no one wanted to publish that one? Correct. It was actually uh, called uh, Creating Health, the uh, Mind-Body Connection. So I self-published the book and then, you know, somebody placed it in a bookstore, was picked up by an agent's um, son for her birthday and she then got me a regular publisher it became a bestseller and then uh, the rest uh, after that I was publishing non-stop your new book is called abundance it sounds so wonderful life in abundance but what does it really mean life in abundance well, ask yourself um, why in every seed there is this promise of thousands of forests. Ask yourself why there are 2 trillion galaxies, 700, 6 trillion stars, and uh, uncountable trillions of planets, possibly 60 billion habitable planets in just the Milky Way galaxy based on what we call the Goldilocks zone. Ask yourself, if for every thought you have access to an infinity of more thoughts, for every uh, creative idea you have, uh, there's an infinity of more to be had. For every image you construct in your consciousness, there are infinite more. So our essential state is actually infinite and non-reducible and fundamental but it is not what we call the mind or the body or even our experience of the physical world or what we call the physical world, which is a translation of sensations, images, feelings, and thoughts, and that we call the physical world or the physical body. So what is the source of all this? The source of all this in great wisdom traditions is uh, what we call pure consciousness. So pure consciousness is not the mind, it is beyond the conditioned mind. I wrote a previous book, as you know, called Meta Human, which is how do we wake up to that, um, which is beyond our mind, which is conditioned by history, by culture, by religion, by society, by upbringing, by education, on and on. So our minds are limited. Uh, our bodies are, are a projection or a construction of sensations. And so is the world. But what is the source of all this in the wisdom traditions is pure consciousness. Pure consciousness is a field of infinite possibilities. It's unpredictable. It's creative. It's a field of synchronicity or non-local correlation. 
it is the source of attention and intention. If it comes from there, the attention and intention, not uh, from the conditioned separate ego mind, then it has infinite organizing power. So abundance in layman's terms could be called generosity of spirit. You know, these days, it's unfashionable to talk about soul, spirit. Uh, people have, again, conditioned ideas about these entities or God. So uh, I think we can just say consciousness or awareness as the fundamental reality. Actually, you know, uh, since you're from the Netherlands, um, I had a great uh, mentor um, in, um, in, in, in the Net Netherlands who spoke about uh, fundamental reality as a-causal, non-local, quantum mechanical interrelatedness, Herms Romain. He was a neuroscientist in Amsterdam and, you know, he came to some of my talks. I got a lot of uh, insights about what uh, would be the modern version of what we call spirit, generosity of spirit, abundance, infinite abundance. Is there a difference between consciousness and awareness? Some people think so. So awareness could be uh, without conscious experience. And consciousness is once con awareness modifies itself into experience. But as you know, a lot of experience is not uh, conscious. Uh, you, you may not have consciously heard something, uh, in your sleep, but it still gets somehow uh, programmed into your mind. So there is what we call the conscious mind. And then, you know, in modern language, there's something called the unconscious mind or the subconscious mind. We were talking about consciousness and the subconscious mind. And I know for for a lot of people, it's very hard to connect with that other part of yourself because most people see themselves only as the body we live in and they don't understand that there, there's so much more of who we really are. C can you explain or advise how, how we can connect to, to the inner self? Well, there are uh, throughout ancient uh, wisdom traditions, there are techniques uh, which sort of fall under the rubric of meditation, such as mindfulness, uh, reflection, contemplation, uh, focused uh, um, awareness, um, concentration I mentioned, um, and transcendence, uh, which is going beyond subject-object split. The nature of reality is that it's a unified experience in one source. Your mind, your body, and what we call the physical world are a unified experience in consciousness. If somebody asked uh, you, where is this experience happening? Some people would say it's happening on the computer screen but the computer screen is not having an experience. Others would say, and the experience is having is occurring in the brain. But again, the brain has no experience. All you see is electrochemistry in the brain. But you don't experience electrochemistry. You experience what we call colors and shapes and forms and sounds and tastes and textures and smells. You experience thoughts, you experience feelings and emotions. You experience imagination. Where is all this happening? You know, if I put a knife through the brain, nothing happens. Uh, you don't even experience pain. So uh, the brain certainly shows correlates of experience in the form of electrochemistry, what we call the neural correlates of experience, NCE. But where is the experience actually happening? And, you know, you said it's a, it's a mystery. This is called the hard problem of consciousness. And I think we can say clearly that the experience is happening in awareness. Uh, where else could it be happening? If there's an experience outside of awareness, then it's not accessible to us. 
the only experiences we have are in our own awareness. Then the next question is, where is this awareness? Can we see it? Can we scientifically document it? And that is seems at first a reasonable question, but uh, it's actually not a reasonable question because that awareness in which the experience is happening doesn't have a form. If it had a form, you would be able to see it, but it has no form. So by definition, uh, it has no boundary. And therefore, by definition, it is infinite. And therefore, by definition, it is not, uh, not accessible to the limited mind, by definition. Uh, the, the, the only thing we can say about this experience right now, it's happening now. It's happening here. And where is this here? It's, it's just where you are, you know, where your body is, where your mind is. But your body and mind is not the source of experience. It is being experienced in awareness, in the form of sensations, <laughs> images, feelings, and thoughts. And then the rest is a construction. That's a changing body. But, you know, there's no such thing as a body in, independently of awareness. Um, body is just a modification of awareness in the form of changing perceptions. You know, you say, I have a body. Which body are you talking about? You started as a fertilized ovum, then you were a zygote, then you were an embryo, then you were a baby and a toddler, young adult, teenager, old adult, all the way to dusty death. So the body is not a noun, it's a verb. And so to mind, mind is, you know, you, can you tell me what thoughts you were having last Thursday at three o'clock? You have no idea. Because thoughts come and go like clouds in the sky, as do emotions. So what is having the experience? Awareness. Where is it? Has no location. That's why we say non-local, infinite, irreducible, and non-conceptualized. You cannot conceptualize it. Concepts are limiting. But, you know, there's a great poem of Rumi. He was asked, who are you? He said, um, he said, if you label me and define me, you'll starve yourself of yourself. Um, uh, nail me down in a coffin with cold words, and that box will be your own coffin. Um, yeah, I'm your own voice echoing off the walls of God, which means... Um, um, Everything that we see is a projection, including our body, including others, including the Milky Way galaxy. It's a projection of consciousness. As I said, this is not an easy concept to grasp unless you're in the habit of being aware of your body and what we call the body in the form of sensations, which is a technique called vipassana, or in the habit of being aware of your emotions or thoughts or you are in a habit of constantly reflecting, who am I? What is it that wants to know the answer to that question? What am I? Am I the changing body or am I the awareness in which the changing body is an experience? Am I the changing mind or am I the awareness in which the changing mind is an experience? Now, you know, these days it's, it's unfashionable to talk about religion. People say, you know, I'm spiritual, I'm not religious, but the religious experience and the spiritual experience is actually a shift in identity from the body-mind to the source of the body-mind, which is non-local, timeless. Uh, it also is the emergence of what we call platonic truth, goodness, beauty, harmony, love, compassion, joy, equanimity. And finally, it is also the experience of the loss of the fear of death, because awareness being non-local is not subject to birth and death. When I speak about this, this is very abstract, but you know, I've written books where I offer practices, including abundance, where we offer practices through the seven centers of awareness. And now these seven centers are in Indian tradition called chakras or wheels of awareness, but that's a metaphor. Ultimately, experiences and awareness, and the seven levels are kind of an extension of the hierarchy of uh, needs as defined by Abraham Maslow. 
And actually, if you look at Abraham Maslow's notes, it's obvious that this is where he got this knowledge from. And before he died, he was actually going beyond what he called self-actualization to self-transcendence, which is going beyond the subject-object split. And if we speak about the mind, is that something different than the, the self-awareness, the, the self-consciousness? Is it a different concept? Yeah, totally different concept. You know, when you go to conferences, even on the mind, there are a lot of people who I go to these conferences where you have cognitive scientists and so on, and nobody can come up with a good definition of mind. But finally, I did come across one by um, the neuropsychiatrist Dan Siegel from UCLA. Uh, and I modified it a little bit for my own purposes. Here is what the mind is. The mind is a relational and embodied process that regulates the flow of energy and information in an ecosystem of uh, sentient relationships. Now, it sound, sounds very abstract, but just go to the words. Embodied, it's in the body, not just in the brain. The mind is in the body, relational. You can only have a mind in relationship to other minds. Right now, my mind is in relationship to your mind and also in relationship to all the minds that are uh, hearing this conversation. So it's a process which is embodied in the cells of our body. And it is also relational. And it is the flow of energy and information. In this case, the energy is photons and electromagnetic energy. And it is embedded with information, which is our conversation. So that's a very good definition of mind. When you realize then that you don't actually have a mind. The mind is, is uh, interdependent on all other minds. Actually, even your body is uh, part of a larger body. We call it the planet of the biosphere. And the atoms and molecules in your body are constantly recycling through the ecosystem of um, molecules and atoms that recirculate in our bodies, so in trees and animals and birds and flora and fauna and bacteria. Ultimately, what we uh, call the matrix is actually a correct word. The matrix is the interdependent co-arising of minds and bodies. We are part of a larger body and we are part of a larger mind. And scientifically speaking, even the atoms and molecules of your body uh, came from the crucible of burning stars. 50% of the atoms in your body are not even from Milky Way galaxy. As I mentioned, there are two trillion galaxies. And 50% of the atoms come from other galaxies um, uh, in, as a result of a phenomenon called gravitational wind. So who are you? Well, you're the whole universe. At this moment, a process that we call a human being. And, you know, humans like to create classifications. We call ourselves homo sapiens. We give names to other species. It's uh, all a convenient fiction which makes science and technology possible, but hides the fundamental truth of one, one consciousness, innumerable minds, innumerable bodies, innumerable objects, but one consciousness. Actually, we're all one. There's one big oneness. And there's one big question. Why do so many people on this planet fight each other? Why are there so many, so many conflict? Why, Why can't we express more love and kindness? Because of our conditioning, which goes back to tribal, primitive, medieval minds. That prime, prime medieval mind is recycling right now in our ecosystem with the great tragedy. What you see in Russia and Ukraine and the Middle East, you know, war, famine, social injustice, economic injustice, climate change, all these are projections of the conditioned tribal mind. And now in the past, that could have worked. It never worked really as a solution to problems. But now we have the same tribal primitive mind, but we have modern capacities. We have 
biological warfare, we have nuclear weapons, we have mechanized ways of killing with each other, we have drones. So right now what we're seeing is the projection of the collective uh, divided mind, which um, results in social injustice, economic injustice, war, terrorism, climate change, extinction of species. Uh, we are sleepwalking our way to extinction. Last extinction was 69 million years ago when a meteorite fell on this earth and, you know, dinosaurs were wiped out in the matter of hours or days. This is what is going to happen to human beings unless we uh, suddenly wake up. We are right now sleepwalking to extinction. The world is transforming. Do you believe that we are heading to a new era of love and light? Or do we have to really awaken consciousness, global consciousness, before evil will rule on this planet? 100%. We have to wake up and it's urgent. The technologies are there, and, you know, to reverse climate change, to resurrect even extinct species, to create a planet of uh, global peace and prosperity. You know, I'm also much thinking if I had the help, you know, uh, Right now, artificial intelligence uh, is being touted as uh, uh, a solution to many uh, situations. I'm using artificial intelligence right now to create, uh, you know, uh, a deeper understanding of the future of well-being. So we could use AI and biofeedback and uh, also bioregulation and self-evolving artificial intelligence uh, uh, systems to actually create a system of health which would be predictable, preventable, participatory, a process, but uh, would actually help us bioregulate our bodies. So the other day I was thinking if we could create an AI system that could predict uh, peace and prosperity based on certain measures, you know, because peace and prosperity go together right now because of what's happening in Ukraine. We think the sanctions are pun punishing the Russians, but they're punishing everyone. You know, everyone is, economies are interdependent. And it's so obvious that um, no violent solution, including sanctions, are going to work because, you know, people, people are losing jobs. So uh, I would love to have, enlist the help of anyone listening right now to help me create an AI system which is predictable in actually offering solutions to conflict resolution. Act, the techniques for conflict resolution are there. You know, have respect for your adversaries, recognize the perception of injustice on both sides, recognize that fear is a factor on both sides, use the principles of emotional intelligence, don't be belligerent, understand other people's values, don't bring religion or ideology into a conversation, don't prove the other person wrong, but that's not enough. Nonviolent communication is not enough. How do we create that system of communication and actually predict peace and prosperity? And, you know, prosperity and peace go together. We always say peace and prosperity, you know, but we don't have it. So how about creating an artificial intelligence system, which is self-evolving, self-learning, that helps people create peace and prosperity in their personal lives and their communities, ultimately in the world. And take an example, you know, if we had Kashmir, Pakistan, India right now, always conflict, China on the border, always conflict, their neighbors. Imagine a system that could predict, you know, how about we go to the Himalayas and we create the best ski resort in the world. This is the economics. This is how Pakistan benefits by bringing to the table their strengths. This is how China, this is how Kashmir, this is how India. Same thing with Palestine and Israel. Can we do that? Same thing with Russia and its neighboring states. Same thing as a global system, because we are, a, you know, nation states are a convenient fiction. You know, the border between Canada and US and, 
and uh, and Mexico is a cultural border. Similarly, in Europe, you know, you travel a few. I've, I've been to Flodrop and Amsterdam, and I have to travel a few miles here and there. And I'm in Germany, France, Switzerland. So these are cultural uh, divisions. They're not actually physical divisions. And even the cultural divisions, when you have maximum diversity, is good. Maximum diversity, emotional and spiritual bonding, and complementing each other's strengths, you can create a more peaceful, just, sustainable, healthier, and joyful world. Part of that is our own awakening. Yes, I, that's what my book Meta Human was about. That's what my book Total Meditation was about. In a way, that's what how to create abundance is also about. But how about if we actually collectively embark? And uh, this would be very practical. It's not hopelessly abstract. And it's, it's the need of the time. We need to do this urgently. We are at a crossroads. One road is well-traveled and has been recycling for thousands of years and is causing devastation in the world. The other road is less traveled, but let it, let's make it the road well-traveled and let's actually create what is called emergence. Emergence happens when you have two um, new contexts, new meaning, new relationships, and a new story. The old story has to die. It's a death and a resurrection. Today, you know, I'm a fan of technology. I think technology can be used to um, devastate and, and, and cause our extinction. But technology by itself is neutral. We can use the same technology to create a more peaceful, just, sustainable, healthier, and joyful world. We need a critical mass of people, in my mind, a billion people, who are in social and, uh, and personal transformation to be the change they want to see in the world. So it's very practical. This is not abstract. One billion people, you say. About 50 years ago, in the 70s and 80s, the, you named Flodorp, uh, the Maharishi Majyogi, he had a vision that if enough people daily at the same time or in big groups, a lot of people together would meditate, uh, that w would have a huge positive impact on the world. D d do you share that same vision? I do, I do. Maharishi was my guru and uh, my mentor. So I share that totally. But uh, at that time when Maharishi was speaking about all this, there wasn't data, there was some, um, but there wasn't the kind of data we have now. And there wasn't the practical means to share that. Right now, you and I are having a conversation, which theoretically could be shared with, with a billion people. Mm -hmm. Deepak, let's go back to the book. Uh, the cover says, abundance is an enlightening guide to success, fulfillment and wholeness, offering practical advice on how to cultivate a sense of abundance in times of fear and insecurity. That's today's reality. Today, a lot of people do not live in abundance. People suffer, they, they live in pain, they have lack of money, they have mental problems. Um, look to the world we, we live in at a moment. What advice can you give? What, what can these people do or learn to live a better life? So abundance is at several levels, you know, survival and safety is one level. Love and belongingness is a second level. A third level is material abundance <coughs> in the form of money. A fourth level could be creative expression. Fifth level could be insight, intuition, imagination. Sixth level could be higher consciousness. And seventh level could be transcendence. So what I did in this book, Abundance, what I did is, you know, everybody tries to solve problems mentally, but the problems are created mentally by the conditioned mind. So no solution can come from the source of the problem, mental solution. This book is not about how to use mental techniques. In a way, it's drawn from what people would call Tantra. Tantra is a Western word that's become popular in that people think Tantric rituals are sexual and spiritual rituals. But Tantra, properly pronounced Tantra, is any ritual that can be used to channel 
energy information and intention. So tantra and mantra and yantra go together. Yantra is a visual outcome. Tantra is the ritual and mantra is the sound syllable that in a way uh, traps the energy information through intention. It's, it's a scaffolding mantra. The word mantra comes from the word man, which means mind, and tra, instrument of the mind to go beyond the mind. So as you'll see, there are in the book, you know, seven uh, basic rituals. We start with top-down approach in this case, starting with bliss and going all the way uh, to uh, security and safety and being grounded in what we call the physical world. <clears throat> So the book is actually a modern day adaptation of ancient ritualistic techniques. People should not understand ritual as empty of uh, meaning. Ritual actually embodies experience with meaning. It is a way of trapping energy, information, and then channeling it to a desired outcome. That's what the book Abundance is ultimately about. Um, I first thought of writing the book when I heard a, a lyric by Bob Marley, which said, some people are so poor, all they have is money. And, you know, I asked myself, does money buy you true love? Does money buy you compassion? Does money conquer the fear of death? Does money uh, ensure that you will not have old age infirmity? Does money buy you creativity? It does nothing of the sort, but yet we need money. Um, for our physical comforts, and it has an important place, but it's not by itself abundance. Uh, abundance is something that we read a lot about in spiritual magazines, and I know uh, people who live spiritually, they love the word abundance, and they have an aversion to, to money, like um, money is evil, uh, wealthy people are bad. Uh, and for a lot of people, it's confusing that you write about the laws of success, and money and mindfulness and and wealth and how can you you merge the two the both separate worlds uh, into one but how can one live that all in one life in a spiritual yogi lifestyle well if you think money is spiritually uh, not something that uh, is congruent, then that will ensure one thing, you'll be poor for the rest of your life. And, you know, some people, they take vows of poverty in religious traditions. And yet the religious institutions themselves are very rich, whether they're the Vatican or, you know, the synagogues of the world or the temples of India, or the mosques. So it's a method to control and manipulate uh, people, this guilt and shame about uh, um, spirituality and affluence going together. Now, uh, I come from a tradition, uh, Vedanta, which is just the opposite, it says there are four goals of life, dharma, finding your meaning and purpose in your life, like expressing your unique talents, artha, which literally means money and material success, kama, which means pleasure and and, uh, and delight of the five senses, including sexuality. And finally, moksha, the freedom to enjoy everything and yet be detached from it. This is uh, because only when you're detached with it, you can actually create. And detachment is a very practical thing. It means process-oriented instead of outcome-oriented. Today, our world is outcome-oriented and therefore stressed. If I'm walking this road because I want to get to a certain destination, but I only look at the destination, I'll stumble where I am. But if I walk the road, I'll get to the destination. So it's a, just a shift in, uh, in awareness as usual. But do you visualize? Do you visualize outcomes or dreams or, or desires you yeah. have? Yes. So in the tantric techniques, you visualize not just in terms of images, but in terms of sounds, in terms of tastes, in terms of smells, in terms of textures, in terms of feelings, in terms of emotions, and in terms of thoughts. So they all go together. 
they're entangled sensations images feelings thoughts are entangled you change one you know if i think of my mother who's long gone i see her face in my consciousness i can even remember the smell of her skin the sound of her voice um, and the emotions that i had that's all part of the visualization process but visualization as commonly understood you know, and this law of attraction and all this nonsense is, is a totally mental thing. You have to go beyond the mental thing into the rituals that allow sensations, images, feelings, thoughts to actually construct your reality. And then you follow a process which involves meditation. We call it dharna, focused awareness in intention, in visualization, dhyan, med meditation, and and samadhi, which is transcendence. Mm -hmm. I, I was just thinking uh, about abundance. Uh, if we look to to our world today, more and more people uh, they own billions uh, of the wealth in the world, and billions of people live in poverty. But would there be a, a solution in your, in your vision to, to equal more that, that abundance upon all the people on this planet? I think everyone deserves abundance. And there, if, if the source of abundance is infinite, then everybody deserves that. Uh, it's just that we have been bamboozled by the tribal mind. But I, I know if, if I'm teaching, I always get this question, uh, if you know so well how to teach what you wrote in this book, how does it uh, apply to people in Syria or Africa or in war zones? Uh, how, how can they profit from, from your wisdom? We should, uh, all, in all seriousness, we should create an app for them and help them to, um, you know, reading books is these days, people are not reading books, even though I write them constantly. <laughs> uh, people need very practical tools, apps, artificial intelligence, critical mass. Um, you know, my heart weeps for those people in Syria and uh, all the people suffering in the world. And uh, there's nothing like I would like to do more than help create abundance for everyone in the world. Um, and it needs uh, a collective effort. I, uh, one person can't do it. We need, as I said, maximum diversity in education, in, uh, in the arts, in music, in poetry, in philosophy, in science, in technology, and ethnic background, uh, maximum diversity, emotional and spiritual bonding, and shared vision. If we have those three components, we can create a new world. Please allow me to read a short paragraph of the foreword uh, of your book. Um, Golden diamonds are only found by searching and digging. You can find all the truth about yourself if you're willing to dig deep into the mind of your own soul. If you do, you will discover that you are the maker of your own character and the creator of your own destiny. This book, Abundance, gives you a better understanding of money consciousness in a spiritual way. But while reading it, I noticed that it's also a quest. You ask a lot of questions. I think reading the book is, is not too hard, but thinking over all the questions needs time. C can you share some of the questions from the book with us? The questions are right in the beginning where I do the soul profile. In the English version, it's about page 10 or so, where there are a few questions that you've answered. It gives you a sense of what is really valuable in your life what you value and what we call money or currency is the exchange of values we call it currency and uh, we call it exchange you know, the stock exchange so what is stock exchange doing it's exchanging values of people if you know your values you know and you hang out with people who have similar values you can create a lot of money as well so that's how it's the questions is basically, you know, as has been said historically, the unexamined life is not worth living. You have to examine your life. Finally, Deepak, uh, you're 75 years old. Uh, you look so healthy and, and vital. What do you do to stay young as you are? 
I don't take myself seriously. I don't get offended by people. I don't get flattered either. Um, I practice yoga every day. I meditate every day. And I love what I do. I'm in my dharma. So, you know, I'm physically uh, very energetic, but I also have access to love and compassion and the creative mind and to laughter and humor. I mean, I look at all the leaders of the world. No one is even smiling. They must be miserable. Maybe that could be your wish for the world, is it? Oh, I do. Peace, joy, laughter and love. May I thank you so much for sharing this moment together with me, with all these people, these lovely yes. souls. And thank you to Master Academy for helping me with this message. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deepak. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wish Goodbye. You. Goodbye. Bye-bye.